Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the video notes for Chapter 5, Section 3 in your Pre-Calculus Trigonometry class. Uh, this section is, is teaching us how to solve trigonometric equations. Now this particular topic is going to require a lot of background stuff from previous in the course. Uh, one, we've got to understand that sine and cosine waves specifically are wave functions meaning that there are lots and lots and lots of solutions to a trig equation. Uh, two, we are going to have to be familiar with and comfortable with the unit circle. So here's a unit circle with the tangent values written in around the outside. And we have to understand that each angle, 60, 45, 30, or whatever it is, has a radian equivalent because we will be solving these equations and our answers will be in radians. So those numbers around the inside that all involve pi, that is how we're going to express our answers. Remember that each point around the edge of your unit circle lists the cosine of that particular angle and then the sine of that particular angle as the x and y coordinates. Cosine is the x, sine is the y. Around the outside of those numbers then I've written the tangent values all the way around. Remember that tangent is sine divided by cosine. So if you take the y coordinate and divide it by the x coordinate, that is where those blue tangent numbers are coming from. From there, we can get secant, cosecant, and cotangent using our reciprocal trig identities. So that means we need to have basically all of trigonometry up to this point figured out, as well as a good, strong mastery of algebra skills in order to solve these problems. So let's get started here. Find all the solutions to the equation on the interval 0 to 2 pi, including 0, but not including 2 pi. Let's talk about why they are restricting that. See, the blue line that you see in your screen is the cosine wave, y equals cosine of x. The red dotted line is the line y equals 1 half. So we learned in algebra that anywhere where those two lines intersect would be a solution to the equation cosine of x equals 1 half because that's where these two lines intersect. Now, for what we know about wave functions, that blue line and that red line, they both extend forever to positive and negative infinity, which means there are an infinite number of solutions to this equation on the interval negative infinity to infinity. So we restrict that um, domain value from the, or, from the zero line up to the two pi line just to give ourselves one rotation worth of solutions. So 0 is included, 2 pi is not. Now, uh, if we look, that means there are two areas, two values where those two lines intersect. We've got one there and one right there. Now, we could also find these on our uh, unit circle because cosine is positive in two of our four quadrants. It's positive in quadrant 1 and in quadrant 4, which means there's going to be one answer in quadrant 1, one answer in quadrant 4. So those answers, where is the cosine equal to 1 half, means we would go to our unit circle and we would look for where is the x-coordinate of our point 1 half, which happens twice, at pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. So the answer to where is cosine of x equal to 1 half is pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. So our solutions on the interval 0 to 2 pi would be x equals pi over 3, which is our first quadrant solution, and 5 pi over 3, which is our fourth quadrant solution. It's worth noting that both of those angles have a reference angle of pi over 3, meaning we should realize that we're talking about the 60 degree angle in quadrant 1 and quadrant 4. That's the pi over 3 and the 5 pi over 3. Now if we look at that on the in interval negative infinity to infinity, we have to write those answers in terms of uh, n, an integer. Okay? We take those values and we say, oh, well, that would occur every rotation. So we can add as many rotations as we want to. Okay, we can do the same thing with 5 pi over 3, because every rotation there would be two solutions to that equation. Now, 
Now the only restriction here is that n does have to be an integer, so when I'm saying integers I'm talking about the integers. Okay? So keep that in mind that we could plug in any n value we wanted. That's why we generally are going to see this interval restriction. Okay? We're only looking at the first rotation. Now, I'm not saying it's always going to be that easy because it isn't. Okay? Occasionally, we're going to have to deal with the fact that there's more than one trig identity in the equation, uh, or even like they'll look like quadratic equations, they'll look like linear equations, square root equations. So that's why I said there needs to be a very strong background in algebra. So, for instance, if we were going to solve these two equations on the interval 0 to 2 pi, when we solve for a trig equation, we first need to isolate that trig equation. So here on number one, we would need to get rid of the tangent on the right side because we don't want to have a tangent on both sides. We want it to be solved for tangent of x. Now while we're at it, we might as well move the square root of 3 to the right side of the equation, which is just us rearranging the equation. 2 tangent x minus tangent x is 1 tangent x equals the square root of 3. So we're looking for tangent values of the square root of 3. Now there should be two solutions. There should be a solution everywhere where tangent is positive. There's tangents positive in quadrants 1 and quadrant 3, meaning there should be two answers, 1 in quadrant 1, 1 in quadrant 3. Well, remember that tangent is sine over cosine. So when we're looking for this, we are looking for this particular fraction where sine of x is root 3 over 2 and cosine of x is 1 half because when we divide those, that's how we get that square root of 3. So we're really looking for where is sine of x equal to root 3 over 2 and cosine equal to 1 half in quadrant 1 and then those same reference angles in quadrant 3. So if we go to our unit circle, and we, even if we don't have the tangent values written in there, we should be able to realize that that is referring to where tangent is the square root of 3. Well, that happens twice, once in quadrant 1 at pi over 3, and once in quadrant 3 at 4 pi over 3. So our two solutions would be pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. Oops, wrong button. Pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3, wrong button again, come on Wills, would be our solutions. Pi over 3 is your first quadrant, answer. And 4 pi over 3 is the same reference angle in quadrant 3. So it's, you can see how all these other things we've worked on throughout trig would come in handy here. Okay, on to number 2. Same idea, we need to isolate sine x, so first we would subtract 2 sine x from each side. That is to get rid of the sine x on the right side. That would turn our equation into 2 times the sine of x equals the square root of 2. Then we would need to divide by 2, which would give us that the sine of x is the square root of 2 over 2. Now that is a positive value. Sine of x is positive in quadrants 1 and 2. Which means we should have one answer in each quadrant. We're going to go in and look for where is sine equal to the square root of 2 over 2. So we go in here and we say, okay, the sine is the square root of 2 over 2. That is the y coordinate, which occurs twice. It occurs at pi over 4, and 3 pi over 4 radians. So our answers to this equation would be pi over 4, which is our quadrant 1 answer, and 3 pi over 4, which is our quadrant 2 answer with the same reference angle. All right, on to the next couple. Again, this is a video. If you need to stop it and look at something, you're always able to do that. Okay, on the next one, we see a sine squared. Now, this doesn't change our approach. We still need to solve for sine of x. So first, we would subtract 1 from each side, which would give us 4 sine squared x equals 3. 
then we would divide by 4. Again, the idea is we're trying to solve for the sine of x. That would give us sine squared of x equals 3 fourths. Now, we're almost done because we don't want to solve for sine squared. We want to solve for sine. So we need to get rid of the squared. Well, to get rid of squared, we take the square root. Now, there's two things to remember when you take the square root of one of these functions. Uh, we do just have a sine x on the left side, but on the right side, we need to remember two things. One, when we take a square root in algebra, we're talking about a plus or minus symbol needing to appear because it could be the positive square root or it could be the negative square root. And then in addition, we need to remember that when we take the square root of a fraction, that is the same as taking the square root of the top and putting it over the square root of the bottom. This is important here because 3 does not have a square root, so it's just root 3, but 4 does have a square root, it is 2. So we're looking for values where sine of x is equal to positive or negative root 3 over 2. Well, it's positive in quadrants 1 and 2, and it's negative in quadrants 3 and quadrant 4 which means there are going to be four answers to this. And that's why that plus or minus symbol is so important, because we need to get all four answers. We're looking where sine is either positive or negative root 3 over 2. So we go to our unit circle, look for y coordinates of root 3 over 2. There's the two positives at pi over 3 and 2 pi over 3. And then we have two negative ones at 5 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. So we have a total of four answers, pi over 3, 2 pi over 3, 4 pi over 3, and 5 pi over 3. So we have two answers for positive. Those answers are x could either be pi over 3 or x could equal 2 pi over 3. And then for the negatives, x could be 4 pi over 3, which is your third quadrant answer, or 5 pi over 3. Again, that's one answer from each quadrant, four answers total. Okay, the next one is going to be the last one on this video. Then we'll start a second video because I don't want these to get too long. The longer they are, the longer they take to put on YouTube. So again, same idea. We want to solve for cotangent of x. So first we would subtract 4 which would give us 3 times the cotangent squared of x equals 3. Then we would divide by 3, which would give us the cotangent squared of x is equal to 1. Finally, we need to get cotangent, not cotangent squared, so we take the square root. When we take the square root, we are looking for values where the cotangent of x is positive or negative 1. Square root of 1 is positive or negative 1. So cotangent is positive in quadrants 1 and 3. And cotangent is negative in quadrants 2 and 4. Now that being said, these values themselves, we are going to be a little bit more difficult. Remember that cotangent is cosine divided by sine, which means we are looking for a situation where the sine and the cosine have the same value. That would imply that the cosine and sine need to be root 2 over 2. Whether they're positive or negative, when we divide them, we're either going to get 1 or negative 1. So the cotangent is positive 1, where cosine and sine have the same value and the same sign. That occurs in quadrant 1 here. That's a cotangent of 1 at pi over 4. And in quadrant 3, where they're both negative, a negative divided by a negative is a positive 1 as well. So those two would be our answers for positive 1. And then for negative 1, we're looking for the same value with different signs, which would happen here at 3 pi over 4 and here at 7 pi over 4. Again, notice the symmetry. All four answers are 45 degree angle lines in each quadrant. So back over here to our answer. We're going to write this out 
we have x is pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4, which are our quadrant 1 and quadrant 3 answers. Or where x is negative 1, which is 3 pi over 4 or 7 pi over 4. Again, those are our quadrant 2 and 4 answers. All right, there's several more videos worth of these notes, so please continue to the next video if you need to see more of it. Thank you very much for your time and attention.